Hi, I'm Jay Schuyler at the Diabetes Research Institute at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine in Miami, Florida. I'm a professor there and deputy director of the Diabetes Research Institute. The perennial problem is, and it's been picked up by people who do continuous glucose monitoring, is that if you take a meal and the insulin at the same time, even though that you're using a rapid-acting insulin analog that are currently marketed, the blood sugar rises in the first half hour to one hour before the insulin kicks in, which takes 45 minutes to an hour to an hour and a half. So that by two hours, the, which was what was done in the clinical trials, this, the, the current rapid-acting insulin analogs beat regular insulin, the previous insulin that was used, but they still fail to control things early on. So what we need is a super rapid acting insulin. There are a number of companies that are currently working on super rapid acting insulins. The one that is soon to be pending FDA review because it had just finished is, is Mankind's Afreza, which is an inhaled preparation. It's a super rapid acting insulin that happens to be inhaled. There are a number of others that, that, that have been pursued. One of the farthest along in development has been the combination of uh, hyaluronidase, an enzyme which breaks down uh, tissue temporarily and allows faster absorption of insulin, which has been mixed together with the, the current rapid-acting insulin analogs. And I presented one of the papers on that last year at the European diabetes meetings. Another company called Biodel has ingredients in it which accelerate the, the absorption. And, and Novo Nordisk is working on what it calls uh, uh, fast insulin aspart, uh, trying to make insulin aspart, their current uh, insulin analog, work a bit faster by, by putting uh, different substances into that as well. Uh, Lilly just recently announced that they had broken a partnership with a company they were partnering with uh, in terms of also trying to develop a super rapid acting insulin. They didn't state the reasons why or the results. But, but it, it's something that obviously everybody is showing a lot of interest in at the current time is super rapid acting insulin. Uh, you know, I think that, that uh, anybody who needs prandial insulin could very well uh, use a uh, inhaled super rapid acting insulin instead of an injection of a rapid acting insulin with a meal. Uh, that's the, uh, the easy place that it potentially fits in both type 1 or type 2 diabetes if they need a, a prandial insulin in type 2 diabetes. The interesting thing that has been asserted and which, for which more data are needed is would you potentially want to consider a super rapid acting insulin as the very first type of treatment in patients with type 2 diabetes because we know that one of the earliest defects in type 2 diabetes is loss of the rapid component of insulin delivery that we usually see accompanying meals. And that's what leads to the, the initial postprandial hyperglycemia that's seen and that's one of the earliest defects. And so it could be argued that one would want to do that. Uh, as I say, we think, I think we need a few more studies for that. Uh, mankind has asserted that, but, but I think they need a, a convincing study if they're going to get people to really start using that in a routine kind of way. So that's not the low-hanging fruit that you asked for, but, but a, a potentially very interesting aspect of it. I've got in my hand the Exubra inhaling device that was used uh, in the clinical trials and when Exubra was commercially launched. And uh, in order to use it, you had to make it even this big. And so this is the device uh, stretched out and uh, twice as long as it is folded up. And you would take your inhalation here and press. And, uh, you know, then you could close it back up again like this. And when it got to be um, closed up, when we first began doing the studies with it in 1995, this device was about the size of my then cell phone. But along the way, cell phones got smaller and the device did not. And by the time that it was launched a decade later, more than a decade later, uh, it, it really wasn't convenient. In contrast, this is the device that Afreza uses. And you just put the Afreza in there and go, and you can see that's closer to the size of my thumb than the other one, which was the size of my obsolete cell phone. 
and had to be doubled in length to be used. I think that, you know, the technology didn't keep up uh, with the times and folks were, are expecting smaller things. Uh, the other thing about it is that the time course of action of insulin in the, with exubera was identical to what you could get otherwise by injection. And, you know, when you take an injection, you can carry a, a, an insulin pen with you quite easily. This was more bulky to carry and, and it was harder, a harder uh, push on subjects. And the, the real thing about a Frez is not only the small inhaler and that it's inhaled, but it's super rapid acting. And so it has a different kinetic profile and offers therefore a different uh, advantage. And so I think those are two very different things. Exuber didn't make it because I think the device was uh, perceived as a problem, number one. And, and I don't think they, they really, it was really a marketing failure more than anything else. And, you know, I, I served as the lead investigator for uh, their type one studies uh, for, for, for Exuber for Pfizer and chaired their, their uh, medical advisory committee uh, for Exubra. And along the way, as I went to medical advisory committee meetings, I would find that the Pfizer team was changing more or less every year. There wasn't consistency there. And so, you know, there wasn't the, the investment of people into the project on a continuing basis. And I think that um, the, uh, by, by the time the product was finally launched, it was still yet another new team. And, and I don't think they ever really grasped it well enough to get the product positioned right and marketed right. So it was a marketing failure, but in part because of the device, in part because of the continuing change of people. Well, you know, it was, the type 1 study was done uh, with using basal insulin uh, Lantus following label. And the problem with that is the shorter the action of a rapid acting insulin, the more important it is to get the basal insulin dose correct. And the reason for that is with regular insulin, there's a very long tail which contributes to basal insulinemia. With the rapid-acting insulin analogs, there's a tail which contributes to the basal insulinemia. With a Fresa or any super rapid-acting insulin, there's not a tail contributing to the basal insulinemia. So you've got to get the basal insulin right. And when you try to do these kind of clinical trials, that means you're trying to control two separate things. You're trying to, to, to deal with the Fresa component and with the basal insulin, and it's harder to do that with the Fresa component uh, when, they, when, when you're using a super rapid acting insulin. So I think the, the trying to get those things right in the clinical trial and getting them both right could have contributed to the difficulty there and, and led to them having less of a, uh, of a, of a uh, bang up, whiz bang outcome than one might have wanted, but they still met the endpoints needed and I think they're still going to end up getting approved by the FDA. You know, I haven't seen the full report. I've only seen the press release. I would love to see the complete data before drawing conclusions about any of, of, of that because, you know, one has to examine that rather carefully uh, and distinguish when, when events were occurring and what was going on and whether there was a collection of events in the same patient. One of the things that we saw in the Exuber studies going back to that was in one study, there was one patient who had 50% of all the hypoglycemic events. If you excluded that patient, there was many less. And so you, you have to examine these things very carefully, and there's not enough data in the press release to allow me to draw a conclusion about that. I think they should not have raised expectations to 0.5 until they saw results. Um, so, you know, 0.4 met, met the, uh, the regulatory requirement. And, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, one, one always has to be cautious in any given study. The difference between 0.5 and 0.4 is not much. I would not have been advertising that this is what we're going to achieve until you get done. When you get done, you can say what you did achieve. And I think over anticipation, uh, can can lead to confusion.
Uh, I'd try it in anybody who might otherwise need prandial insulin and want to try this. Um, you know, that, that's going to be uh, a number of type 1s. I have people who were in exuber studies with us years ago who say, if, you, if there's another inhaled insulin on the market, I'd love to do that and give up my extra three injections a day before meals. Uh, I think those are the, the, the really low-hanging fruit that will jump for this. But, but I think uh, one has to consider it in, in anybody who would otherwise use prandial insulin.